And welcome to an on-location EW10 bookmark from Denver. Our guest author is Father Timothy M. Gallagher, author of Teaching Discernment, a pedagogy for presenting Ignatian Discernment of Spirits. Always great to see you, Father. Thanks, Doug. We had to come to see you this time here in Denver. We were out here for the family celebration. We got a chance to meet up with you and record uh, this program about this book, Teaching Discernment. One of the things that always strikes me with this is it says after your name, OMV. Uh, meanwhile, there's a bunch of Jesuits in there endorsing your work on Ignatian spirituality. Do you ever have an interesting conversations with them wondering why is an OMV so interested in Ignatian spirituality? Sure, a lot of really nice things around that. And I've been really grateful that a lot of top-notch Jesuits have really supported this work, as you see uh, in the book there. Sometimes what I'll do, let's say I have a few hundred people in front of me when we're gonna teach discernment, and I'll ask, is, is there any Jesuit in the room? Oftentimes there isn't. And I make the point then that Ignatian spirituality is larger than the Jesuit religious order. Uh, of course, it, he, Ignatius founded them, they live out of it, but it's a universal spirituality like Carmelite or Franciscan spirituality or so on. You know, it's, it's for everyone in the church. Right. So that's why an OMV, an Oblate of the Virgin Mary, is engaged in this. Right. And as you can hear, we're on location here, so the bells are ringing. But uh, you say in the beginning of this book, I write this book to share a pedagogy. Now, I use that word. A lot of people might be saying, I don't even know what that means. Pedagogy is an approach to teaching. If you're going to teach young children or adolescents or adults, so forth, or people with a background more or less in a field, you shape your teaching to your audience. And that's what we mean by a pedagogy, a way of presenting a certain content. And this is a pedagogy that I've developed. It's almost 40 years now I've been teaching this. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it work, um, been able to refine it over the years, and I want to pass it on. Right. You say that uh, one of the things you try to do with this is present abundant examples, ordinary examples, the kind we all experience, though often without understanding or knowing how to respond to them. Ignatian, Ignatius supplies the key, why is it important that they're the ordinary things that people can relate to? Because that's what almost all of life and almost all of what the spiritual life is. You look at the, you know, take a St. Thomas More, for example. All right, we're all aware of his heroic martyrdom, but that didn't happen out of nothing. That came out of ordinary, faithful, Catholic living over the years in the family, at his work, and so forth. So for most of us, for example, getting up in the morning and maybe you feel discouraged, I don't know, you're gonna get the report from the doctor or there's something at work that's hang on, hanging on you or your conversation with your teenage college daughter just didn't go that well <laughs> yesterday or whatever it might be. And you're struggling with this. Okay, th right there, that's where Ignatius wants to come to us and help us understand that discouragement from the spiritual perspective and show us what to do. And that's why people love what he's doing because, oh, this is my life. And finally now someone's bringing light to these daily things that I'm always experiencing. Right, you talk about with Ignatius's help, people can then perceive more clearly in what is of God and what is not of God, which is really what so many people are confused by, trying to figure out how do I really discern, quote unquote, God's will in my life. But you talk about something called being doubly free. What's that mean? Free from and free for. So freed from the discouraging lies of the evil one, whom Ignatius speaks of as the enemy most commonly, so that's just the classic triad, the world, the flesh, and the devil, harmful influences which can discourage us and lead us astray. And oftentimes we feel enveloped by this. We don't know what to do with it. Ignatius brings light, clarity, and practical tools. So that's the freedom from, which is really the prelude for the more important freedom for, and that is the freedom to hear God's voice, to say yes to God's love, to live a life of holiness, to pursue the Lord in our vocations. Now, what's different about this book is it's not just talking about it. You say it offers a blueprint for this teaching because you say once people learn of it, they want to share it. That's what generally happens. When pe what, what I'll hear over and over again from people is, depending on the age of the person, maybe we finish the teaching, they'll say, I wish I'd known this 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago. And I love that actually when I hear that because it means it's really sinking in. People see the value of it. And then what happens is people want to share it. Everybody should know this. I, I hear this all the time. Well, this book hopefully provides a, an instrument for people who might feel this is valuable. I'd like to share it. I'm not an expert. I don't know what to do. Well, here's a book that'll show you. It's interesting you say that because so many times in 
in the real presence teaching as mother did or things like that or the insights of the church from scripture like a father Mitch might have or what you're talking about Ignatian spirituality so many people say why didn't anybody tell me about this before well there are lots of different answers to that but I'd like to think that one of them is that this is really something new I hope that doesn't sound too bold but I think it's true this pedagogy didn't exist before. Oh, I see. Elements of it did in scholarly books, but nobody had put them together and shaped them in a way that your, your everyday Catholic mm -hmm. could hear and say, oh, that's me. Now I see what that means. Now I know how to apply it. Again, that's why I think it was valuable to pass this on so that it'll be there. Is that why you did that book on the Liturgy of the Hours as well, that kind of approach? Well, that book really is uh, due to EWTN, mm. <laughs> to tell you the truth, because I had written an earlier book just telling my own story of praying it over the years. And then out of that came one of these series with EWTN on applying the Liturgy of the Hours to the lay vocation. Right. And then EWTN asked me to make that a book. Right, because a lot of people ha are interested in that. You say in this book, because this is the third book you say I've written on the rules, uh, in this book I return to the 14 rules for the third time. The rules are the same, but the perspective is different. How so? because in the other books, the perspective is the person learning the rules. In this book, the perspective is the person who wants to share them with other people. Now you lay this book out in three parts. Why don't you go through what the three parts are? Well, if you're gonna teach the rules, you need to be prepared. So in the first part of the book, I explain the elements of the method and how a person would prepare for it, the different things you'd wanna emphasize and so forth. In the second part, we go through each of Ignatius' 14 rules, and I share the pedagogy I've developed, which I'm fairly confident works quite well now, um, and put that in the hands of the prospective teacher. And, and at the end, we deal with some resources and final questions. You mentioned the fact that if, if I share various examples and metaphors, uh, like the snowball at the top of the mountain, halfway down the mountainside to illustrate Rule 12, that I find helpful in presenting the rules, you can use these examples or make up your own. What if somebody makes up one that actually isn't appropriate? Your audience will tell you. So the ones that I've developed are really refined after, as I said, many years of teaching this. And some of them I've jettisoned along the way because they really don't work as well. The one with the snowball really does work. And what is it? Why don't you remind us what that is? All right, so this is rule 12. Ignatius is letting people know that the key moment, the moment when it's easiest to resist the enemy's temptations is right at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So for example, here's a discouraged man at 10 o'clock in his room after a disheartening day. He normally picks up the Bible, reads for 10 minutes, makes an examination of conscience, but in front of the other hand on his desk is the smartphone and something in him out of discouragement feels the pull toward the smartphone in a way that Ignatius would call low and earthly. And one touch can become 10, become 200. Mm -hmm. All right, when is it easiest to resist that or any parallel temptation? Ignatius says right at the very beginning. Mm. So the easiest time to resist it is before you even reach out to touch it, if with God's grace and some courage. All right, that's stopping the snowball at the top of the mountain because we all know that the longer we dally with the temptation, the harder and harder it gets uh, to resist it. So, so I use that image. I say, here, here is a high mountain covered with snow. Here at the mountaintop, a snowball is just getting started. Mm -hmm. You can put out a finger and stop it. Nice. Let it get halfway down the mountainside, gaining mass and speed, it'll run you over. But that doesn't have to happen if we apply Rule 12. I see, okay. Now you mentioned that I very much desired to write this book. For how long have you very much desired? From the beginning you felt this was needed or is this something that just came to you over the last few years? Well, I'd say it's about 35, 38 years that I've been teaching these rules for discernment. It was only gradually that I began to realize that I had actually developed the pedagogy, which at least in this form uh, did not exist and that was valuable. And as over the years, I began watching it make such a difference in people's lives um, that I realized uh, this is something that really should be passed on. So I can't give you an exact right. year, but I would say maybe 25, 30 years into the teaching, I would began to realize this should be passed on. I think one of the things, and, and you, and you re-go through, through the rules in the beginning, uh, and you talk about somebody trying to move from mortal, uh, going from mortal sin to mortal sin, the enemy is ordinarily accustomed to propose apparent pleasures to keep you there. But then the second rule is in persons who are going on trying to purify their sins and rising from good to better in the service of the Lord, the method is contrary to that in the first rule. 
in, when a, these are two different spiritual situations, a person far from God and living a life of serious mortal sin and the much happier situation of the person, which is probably gonna be most of those who are listening to this conversation. People who with all of our human fragilities really don't want sin and want to love and serve the Lord and grow. In the first situation, the enemy attempts to facilitate that movement away from God. The good spirit attempts to hinder it. Mm -hmm. When the movement reverses toward God, the actions of the spirit I reverse. See. Now it's the enemy who attempts to hinder, discourage, mm -hmm. and the good spirit who attempts to facilitate or encourage. Right. Now, jumping ahead, you had mentioned rule number 12 about the snowball effect. The 12th, the enemy acts like a woman in being weak when faced with strength and strong when faced with weakness. Why a woman? All right, there are all sorts of cultural connotations today which make that difficult. So right. when I teach that, I actually change the metaphor and we use parents and a spoiled child. Okay. Um, both are situations that are contrary to anything God ever intended. God never intended men and women to fight. That's the metaphor in Rome okay. 12, nor that children be spoiled by their parents. But if those metaphor is great, so you've really touched on mm. a nice question here, then what I tell people is if it grates, if something in you says, this doesn't sound right, well, okay. and you're hearing it well because this is a metaphor of the action of the enemy, the one who is anti, the anti-human, the one who is against humanity and human nature as God intended it to be. But the point, his point is that if, uh, beyond the metaphor, the point is that if you are willing to be strong when the enemy first brings his temptation, the enemy's weakness is laid bare. Now, and then the 13th rule, uh, likewise, he conducts himself, um, the enemy, as a false lover and wishing to remain secret and not to be revealed. Here's a person who has a spiritual burden in his or her heart. And you know that feeling that, Lord, I would feel so free to receive your love and love you in response, but then there's the block. Okay. There's the thing that weighs on our heart. There's the fear. There's the unspoken thing. And the enemy wants us to don't talk about it because, of course, as long as you don't talk about it, the burden. That's why he fears confession. Yeah, confession is a wonderful, wonderful resource mm -hmm. here or spiritual direction or right. any conversation with a wise and competent mm -hmm. spiritual person will undo that burden. Right. And the 14th, likewise, he conducts himself as a leader intent upon conquering and robbing what he desires. And this is the one that's always, he attacks at the weakest point. Parenthetically, you see the robbing in there. This mm -hmm. is not a noble leader and defending the common good. This is a leader of a group of plunderers or thieves, basically. So it's a metaphor, again, for the enemy. And of course, what, what, the, what the astute leader does is to attack where the defenses are the weakest. And Ignatius points out that the enemy will do that spiritually, so that if we identify that weakest point, there's no shame in having one, we all do. That's just to be human mm -hmm. in a fallen, loved, and redeemed world. But if we can identify self-knowledge, if we can know what that is and work to strengthen it, beautiful things happen in the spiritual life. Right, and another used to refer to like avoiding occasions of sin, sure. understanding where you are weak and trying to yes. avoid those situations. Too. If a person finds, I always seem to wind up in this discouraging place spiritually, this happens and all the energy gets sapped, that's rule 14 terrain. If we can come with all the tools are given mm -hmm. to understand why that's happening, what the weak point is and work to use the tools to strengthen it. As I say, wonderful things happen. Now you talk about in the very beginning about how it all began. You mentioned in the seminary, you said during those same years, I grew closer to the founder of my religious community, uh, the venerable Bruno. And, and then as I learned more about him, I increased perceived his love and esteem for the Ignatian spiritual exercise. So is that one of the connections for you then? Yeah, I'd say it's the key one. I mean, just personally, I fell in love with them when I made them myself, but it was very much in harmony with our founder. In fact, I did my, um, my doctoral thesis on that very question of the place of the spiritual exercises in Venerable Bruno's life, mm -hmm. the work he gave us, and it was the central part. So to get back to your earlier question, that's why an oblate of the Virgin Mary right, is, is dealing with Ignatian things because that's the heart of what our founder wanted us to do in the church. Okay, you also said, I remember running, this is after the spiritual exercises you went through, you say, for the month, uh, I said to myself, someone has finally taught me how to pray. Ignatius is ever practical. He's not writing a Summa Theologica like St. Thomas, he's writing spiritual exercises. So it's about doing things in the spiritual life. and so. He gets very practical about all of this. That's what these rules are, practical guidelines, teachings on how to pray. 
so that when I finished the, uh, making the uh, Ignatian spiritual exercises with the daily guidance of a wise Jesuit and um, putting his teachings into practice, I felt finally someone's just shown me the basics of prayer. It was beautiful. Right, and you also talk about, uh, I guess you, you gave a retreat and you say something electric occurred. How could you tell what, what was different? It was the first time that I shared these rules in the setting of, this was an eight day uh, Ignatian retreat. So in silence, people praying maybe four times a day for an hour with the scripture and then meeting for an hour with me each day mm -hmm. to look at the experience and where it was going. And each morning I would give a half hour conference in which I went through all of these 14 rules. A teacher knows, you know when there is, um, electric is the right word for it, there is uh, a living connection that what you're saying is meeting a real space in a person's heart and people are drinking it in and finding this enormously helpful. We all knew it. Mm -hmm. And actually this was for a group of sisters and their community had me then do three of these a year right. for the next 10 years. Right. You mentioned, so. uh, you, you, you talk about that in the book. Also, what, what does all of this have to do with a groundskeeper going into a shed? This was one of the retreatants from one of these many retreats where I shared them. So she was looking out the window of her room and she watched the groundskeeper for this retreat center go to the tool shed, go in and come out carrying the various tools he needed for his work. And she said, that's what Ignatius has done for me spiritually. He's given me the concrete practical tools that I need to make sense out of this up and down daily experience in the spiritual life. Mm -hmm. Then you talk about the fruit of this uh, pedagogy. All people of faith who seek to love Jesus experience the spiritual ups and downs Ignatius describes in his rules. At times they find themselves full of spiritual energy. God feels close and they feel his sense of love. At other times, and for reasons they don't always understand, their spiritual energy seems to disappear. I would say that in, as I said, the almost 40 years that I've taught these rules, I have never once, and this is people of all educational backgrounds, ethnic, cultural, various countries, I have never once had one person say to me, I don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I don't know what, it, because this is just, we all know that there are times of spiritual energy, prayer is alive, we have energy to live our faith in times of discouragement when it's hard to even want to pray and so forth. These ups and downs are just right. ordinary, normal experience. And that's what Ignatius addresses. Right, and, and, and that's why you have this comment, it's so wonderful to know that I'm not the only one. Oh, people love that. Yeah, yeah. People love that because so many of us feel ashamed of being discouraged in the spiritual life or days when it's hard to even keep your mind on your prayer or maybe to even want to go to daily mass, if I may say that reverently, mm -hmm. or when you're there distracted and people feel ashamed, it isn't just you, it's every one of us, it's all the saints, it's there in Therese, Ignatius, all of mm -hmm. them. And to know that we're part of a large family living a normal spiritual experience and there's a way to understand it and respond right. to it is enormously encouraging. That's the, really the key reason why I love teaching this mm -hmm. because it engenders hope in people, and not just uh, an emotional hope for a moment, like in a little emotional mm -hmm. high. The hope that comes from, now I understand, now I know what to do. Right, the next time it happens. And you know, I, I would say, Doug, this is getting more and more contemporary as there are, un unfortunately, there are so many reasons now as we look at the culture of the world mm -hmm. and even the sufferings of our church, there are, right. are reasons to be discouraged. A teaching which helps people understand that discouragement and shows them how to overcome it is getting really important. Now, when talking about the teaching, you say teach the text. Yes, I, this seems like a very basic thing, mm -hmm. but as I uh, got into this, I realized the best way to break open for people what Ignatius says is to actually use his own words. Mm -hmm. That may seem like such an obvious thing, but uh, it's not always the case. So when you get close to his own words, a couple things happen. One is you respect his own choices. You're on target. You're not getting uh, caught in tangents here or there. You don't get into things that are too confusing for people. He is fundamental, simple, clear, essential in what he says. And because you're commenting the words of a saint, you're never gonna go too far wrong. Right. Well, you talk about uh, Ignatius lists four tactics in the enemy, bite, sadden, place obstacles, and disquiet with false reasons. You say, uh, I note that the enemy does not immediately tempt one rising toward God with obvious sin. The last thing such a person would want at that time. The enemy does something different. He bites, strives to upset us, to interfere with our service of God, to strip away our peace of mind. Again, my listeners grasp the link between Ignatius' text and their lives. Sure, because that, 
here's, here's a person who is in that second spiritual situation we talked about before, increasing freedom from sin. Maybe they've made a retreat or had a beautiful experience of prayer or read a book which has made a real difference or gone to some kind of um, large Catholic event or whatever it might be. There's new spiritual energy, uh, prayer is alive. The last thing this person wants is obvious sin. Mm -hmm. The enemy doesn't start there then. The enemy starts just by trying to sap the energy a bit. That's the bite, gnaw, mm -hmm. what are there in the Spanish, just to try to diminish it a bit so the person will have a little less uh, energy to go forward. Now, if the person gives into that, mm -hmm. the enemy will come on with other things. But th what Ignatius wants us to see is this is where the enemy will start. Mm -hmm. No shame in experiencing that. Be aware of it, name it for the tactic of the enemy that it, that it is and firmly reject it. Right, in living the rules personally, you said, when we apply these rules in our own lives and so experience their wonderful pr fruit, we will teach them to others with greater energy, conviction, and enthusiasm because we experience ourselves how the rules apply in daily spiritual experience. We will help our listeners make the connection as well. Yes, you can really only share what you have. You know, no one gives what he does not have. So if you want to teach these to other people, you really need to be trying to live them in your own life, which is a, a happy invitation because of the difference they'll make in your own life. And that's why you'll speak about them with such conviction to others, because mm -hmm. you know in your own experience the difference. How it works. In the second part, you, you get into kind of teaching the rules. And one of the things you talk about, emphasizing grace is key to fruitful presentation of the rules. And I cannot emphasize it enough. When I teach the rules, I continually emphasize God's grace. Why? This is a spirituality of redemption, of hope, of grace. Yes, Ignatius is speaking about the enemy's tactics, discouraging lies, the biting, and all these different things that we've just rapidly mm -hmm. mentioned. But that's not the essential focus. The essential centerpiece of all of this is that God has won the victory. Mm -hmm. Redemption is real. Grace is with you. Mm -hmm. And that's why this is a spirituality of hope. So we look at the enemy's tactics so that we can see them clearly, so that we can reject them. But above all, we're looking at the love of the Lord, which is always with us. I thought it was interesting, too, that reverence, reverence is another important point. You were saying. Absolutely key, because when people hear this teaching, or if you are the teacher sharing it, you're touching very deeply sensitive places in people's hearts. And so you, you, you don't bulldoze into those. It's like Jesus who has such reverence. You know, the man who is timid, he lets him come at night. Mary, who is uh, Magdalene, who is suffering so much on the morning of the Easter, just says her name and so forth. Mm -hmm. Jesus is so reverent and sensitive to the hurt places in human hearts. When you do this, when you image in your own teaching Jesus' own reverence for the hurt in human hearts, people expand, mm -hmm. they open up, they'll let the teaching in and then really beautiful things happen. Now, you also mentioned the idea here in of talking about respect for questions. I thought that was interesting. When people find that uh, people are timid, this is new terrain for a lot of people, but they have questions. Mm -hmm. And when they find that you as a teacher listen with respect, with reverence to the question, uh, affirm its goodness, and then treat it with, with respect and, and reply to it. What it does is it encourages that person and everyone else oh, in the, the audience people to, to feel say, comfortable. Well, we can ask questions too. Right, and, feel and then a lot of wonderful things come out. Right, everybody does, nobody wants to be embarrassed by no. thinking they're the only one who doesn't understand, no, I, right? I would never want to do that. Now, the enemy, you say, I employed the word enemy by conscious choice. I find that it serves the teaching well. Years ago, I began presenting the word, you were using the evil one, uh, evil one's tactics. On one occasion, a woman told me that the constant repetition of the word evil was unsettling for her. All right, so just to be clear, when Ignatius uses the word enemy or bad spirit or evil spirit and so forth or bad angel, what he means, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is the classic triad, the world, the flesh, and the mm -hmm. devil. So it's Satan and his associated fallen angels. It's uh, concupiscence as a legacy of original sin and harmful influences around us in the world. So that word enemy is just uh, solidly represents the church's classic understanding. But it's a good word for two reasons. One, because it's a little less invasive, I would say, mm -hmm. than the constant repetition of the word evil. Mm -hmm. And secondly, because it's exactly on target. What we are identifying here is the one who is inimical to, hostile to, set against where God wants things to go in our lives. So I find the term works well. And it's the one that, if you want to get numerical about it, Ignatius uses most frequently. I, I see. In, in the section, the title statement, exploring the text, you talk about 
becoming aware. This is the first step in discernment, simply to notice, become aware of this interior spiritual experience in our hearts and thoughts. For Ignatius, this is the moment when his eyes were opened a little. All right, let's do this. Uh, let me ask both of us in this conversation and anyone listening, what was in your heart and thoughts as you awoke this morning? Mm. Did you even notice? What about last week? What about the last year? What's been going on? All right, this is, this is where it starts, is just to begin to notice the spiritual experience that is always going on in the stirrings of our hearts and in their related thoughts. That's where it all starts. And that's where it started for Ignatius in that dramatic moment, of, well, quiet, but powerful moment mm -hmm. of conversion when suddenly he realized there is spiritual experience going on in my heart and in my thoughts, and that was the beginning. Right, and then you have this paradigm, be aware, understand, take action. That's the heart of the whole thing. What, if and someone says, what is discernment of spirits? The answer is very simple, simple. I mean, living it is life, but it is a spiritual action, or if we want to use Ignatius' own word, a spiritual exercise that invites us to be aware of, to notice the spiritual experience that's always going on in our hearts and our thoughts, work with it with the tools our tradition supplies to, until we understand what's of God and not of God in it, and then take action accordingly. If it's of God, accept it, put it into practice. If it's of the enemy, firmly reject it so that it can never harm us. So what are you working on next? The next book will be a short one for priests applying this teaching to parish life. Well, thank you so much, Father Gallagher. Always a pleasure speaking with you. Great to see you again. Thanks, keep sir. up your wonderful work and keep churning out the books. We'll have you on bookmark in the wonderful series you've done for us over the years. Father Timothy M. Gallagher, the book Teaching Discernment, Pedagogy for Presenting Ignatian Discernment of Spirits, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog, EWTNRC.com. You can order it there, and you can check us out next time right here on Bookmark. Thanks for being with us.